This uh, speaker series is put on by the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. Uh, the, the speaker series is co-sponsored sponsored by Kroll and Mooring uh, and Baker McKenzie, as well as the Center for International Commercial and Investment Arbitration here at Columbia, as well as Oxford University Press, investmentclaims.com. So we want to thank our sponsors very much for their continued support. Um, we also have uh, a few more speakers uh, coming up in the speaker series, which I wanted to remind every, everybody about. Gabriel uh, Bottini, adjunct professor from the University of Buenos Aires, will be speaking on October the 24th, <coughs> as well as Alan Rosas, uh, judge at the European Court of Justice, will be visiting us on October 31st. So uh, I look forward to seeing everyone at, uh, at those lunches. So. Today we have uh, a unique and uh, excellent um, speaker, somebody who has uh, risen up in the arbitration world and is certainly viewed, and, and I think this is an objective statement based on a recent study. Um, our speaker was one of the most influential arbitrators in the world, um, a, a, an honor which is well deserved. She has. Uh, being an arbitrator in over 200 international arbitrations under all the major rules. Uh, she is a professor at Geneva <coughs> University Law School and the founder and director of the Geneva LLM in International Dispute Settlement, uh, MIDS, M-I-D-S. Uh, she's also a co-director of the Center for International Dispute uh, Settlement and she teaches international arbitration law and heads uh, a number of research projects. Uh, her uh, CV is deep and wide, and her experience uh, is enormous uh, in international arbitration widely, but uh, in international investment arbitration, she is also uh, considered one of our leading arbitrators. And we are honored today to have her come and speak on a topic that is of uh, incredible interest and has been uh, uh, grown in interest over the last few years. We've seen in the negotiation of various treaties uh, such as TTIP and TPP, issues surrounding arbitrators. And today she's come to speak to us on a topic titled Accountability of Arbitrators in Investor State Dispute Settlement. So I'd last ask everyone to welcome Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler as today's luncheon speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is Always a pleasure to be back here at Columbia Law School. It's my second time this year, actually, that I get to speak here, and I it is it is a it is a pleasure. But I need to make sure that the microphone is it fine like this, even if I have the two mics. Huh? Does everybody hear me well? Good. So what I uh, thought I would do today is uh, look at the changes that are being contemplated in the structure of investment arbitration under the prism of uh, accountability of investment arbitration or investment arbitrators and uh, I there, there are many uh, there are many projects right now uh, that are being considered. Some are even concluded agreement, not yet ratified, but concluded an agreement like CETA. Uh, is, is everybody familiar with what CETA is? Yeah, it's a, it's a free trade agreement between Canada and uh, the EU that has an investment chapter. We have also an investment court provided uh, like in CETA in the EU Vietnam FTA. We have uh, a proposal that may be more uh, uh, familiar to all of you in the TTIP. There is a proposal for an investment court, in the, uh, an EU proposal. We have references actually in many recent investment treaties and free trade agreements with investment chapters. Uh, programmatic references for about the creation of a court and if a court is created for investment disputes then the parties will to this treaty will join it. Uh, we have also more recently an EU internal proposal uh, for a diplomatic for, to call a diplomatic conference to uh, negotiate a convention 
on investment uh, for the creation of a court uh, in invest on investment disputes. And then we have on trial discussions on future work that could include uh, a, a text about uh, investment, uh, the reform of investment arbitration or investment dispute settlement. Uh, the, uh, Uncertral discussions should not be underestimated because if you look at the other, uh, my other projects or prospects, they, you could think this is an EU syncretic uh, fantasy of an investment court. On the floor of the Uncertral Commission this uh, July here in New York, it, uh, there was a remarkable alignment of states, developing states, transitional economies, developed states, with some notable exceptions, like the US, for instance. But otherwise, there, were, there was a remarkable alignment for in favor of a reform of investor state dispute settlement. And so they, they, the states may have had very different reasons why they wanted a change. But in the end, that doesn't really matter. What matters is, is the political will uh, to uh, implement a, a change and that makes me think that this is a topic we should really take uh, we should take seriously I will look at these changes on the background of what is happening now I will look at these changes under this pr prism of accountability because somehow I need to have a, a theoretical foundation to analyze uh, what is what is happening there is accountability is linked to legitimacy. Accountability is linked uh, to transparency. And uh, these are also matters on which investment arbitration has been found to be uh, deficient. Well, there's a wealth of scholarly writings on these topics in international law, in national law, on international courts, on national judiciary. There's also a lot of uh, writings in political sciences, there's lots of writings in sociology about all these concepts. And so I will not be able to uh, do justice to the richness of the intellectual debate, but I, I just hope that I have not missed anything uh, major uh, in, my, in my analysis. I will uh, speak about the reform accountability uh, in light of the reform proposals in three parts. First, I'd like to just look at the related concepts of legitimacy and transparency. Then I would like to uh, focus more on accountability itself. What is it? What does it mean in investment arbitration? And then I would like to look forward, b building on the findings that we will have reached uh, about uh, look forward to reform, possible reforms. About the related concepts first, um, let me take transparency first because it's easier, it does not require a definition. Uh, to, there's been a lot of criticism over, uh, of investment arbitration that it was not transparent. It was just as behind closed doors and the like. Uh, today we have the instruments to achieve transparency. We have the UNCTRAL uh, transparency rules. We have the Mauritius Convention on transparency. So all that is still missing. What is still missing is the implementation of these and that very much depends on states. States have to ratify the, the, the Mauritius Convention. But we do see in all recent treaties the, re the, the, the transparency rules are referenced and therefore I think it will, it will happen. It will take time but it, will, uh, it is slowly happening. So transparency for me is, is, is a past uh, issue. Uh, legitimacy is of course a more difficult concept. Um, in international law, legitimacy is given by state consent. So the system we have now has been set up by the states. They have fully consented to it and there should be no problem. And yet there are, there are issues. So uh, then we, we have to look at legitimacy uh, differently and uh, maybe not in non-legal terms. And if you look at it in non-legal terms, 
uh, for instance, relying on the on the uh, theories of uh, Max Weber that are still dominant in this area. Uh, you legitimacy is the acceptance that the exercise of authority is justified. And that has the result that those affected will accept, will comply with an order that emanates from this authority. They will do so not because they are coerced, but because they've perceived the authority as legitimate or as justified. They will do so irrespective of the content of the order, even if the order disple uh, dis displeases them. They will, they, will obey, uh, they will obey it. And so I've asked myself, what's the relationship between legitimacy and accountability? And I think the relationship is that accountability is a means to achieve legitimacy. So that leads me then to my second part about accountability. It's often said investment arbitration is not accountable. So what does that mean? Uh, the dictionaries would define accountability or accountable by saying required or expected to justify an action, a decision, responsible, answerable, when one party must report its activities and take responsibility for them. That, that is <coughs> the definition that I would use. It is true that in political discourse, uh, accountability is often used to, uh, in connection with, with loosely defined terms of, or, or loosely defined values of good governance, integrity, responsibility. Uh, but at the same time, I find no uh, consensus on the content of accountability as a value or as a virtue. And therefore, I prefer to look at it uh, like a mechanism or a process, a process to achieve democratic aims, and my focus will be on democratic societies. And in the context of international dispute resolution, the aim, of course, would be the prevalence of the rule of law. And now if we have this aim in mind, uh, we can describe, <coughs> we can describe accountability quite simply. Someone reports is responsible to someone else for something. So let's try and um, apply th this to investment arbitration. Who is responsible? Well, we now assume that it's the arbitral tribunal. For what? If we do an analogy with judges, judges are uh, accountable <coughs> to, for applying the law impartially and fairly. And I think we can transpose this to arbitrators. To whom does the arbitral tribunal report? Now, who controls the arbitral tribunal? Is it the contracting states? that have entered into the investment treaties? Is it the disputing parties? Is it the population of the states that may be affected by the decision? When I ask these questions, you, you sense that there is a clash between accountability and judicial independence. And we all know that judicial independence is the bedrock of the rule of law. And there's a very delicate balance between judicial independence on the one hand and accountability on the other. The national legal systems, all uh, the frameworks for international courts, all struggle with this balance. Some achieve it was more or less, uh, in more or less felicitous terms than, than others. And the scholars identify three pressure points between accountability and uh, judicial independence. The first one is <coughs> about appointment or selection of the decision makers. The second one is compensation of the decision makers. And the third one is discipline over decision makers. So if we think about these pressure points, uh, applying them to investment arbitration, uh, in general, about appointment or selection. 
of who gets to resolve a dispute. In democracies in general, uh, accountability is achieved by way of <coughs> elections. Uh, judges are rarely elected directly uh, because it is considered that the nature of a, an electoral campaign is hardly compatible with a judicial office. And I must say that being in this country these last <laughs> days, I have thought it's not, probably it's not even compatible with a political office. But that's a different topic, right? Um, so judges are not elected directly, but they, they are nominated by the executive or by the parliament or by a combination of both. And that means uh, that achieves indirect accountability and is generally accepted that accountability can result from an accountability chain. So how d what, what do we have in investment arbitration? Uh, nothing of the sort. We have an indirect election that is, that is replaced by a direct appointment by the disputing parties. Now you could tell me, well, I mean, the respondent states gets to appoint an arbitrator. So that achieves accountability. I would say it achieves a part of accountability, but it's not, uh, not to the same extent that you would have uh, for the judiciary in, a, in most democracies. Then let's take compensation. Financial security is, is uh, considered a fundamental guarantee of judicial independence. There's no such thing as like financial uh, security for investment arbitrators. Uh, but at the same time, strangely enough, this doesn't seem to raise uh, concerns because the proposals that are on the table now all adopt the uh, exit uh, model of uh, decision makers that are paid by the case or by the hour and, and have no uh, salary. Discipline, well, in a por permanent court system, you have a president of the court or you have a judicial committee of some sort who can, uh, who can, uh, has ju uh, disciplinary power over judges. Um, who do, has disciplinary power over arbitrators? Well, um, you have an institution that, in institutional arbitration at least, may under certain rules have a power to revoke arbitrators who do not comply with their duties. Uh, that comes closest to the disciplinary power in courts, but at the same time, it of course uh, begs the question of the accountability of the institution. If the institution itself is not uh, accountable, not, ha is not elected in any way, then uh, you, have, you have an issue uh, there. In addition, it is of course more difficult to discipline a, a moving core of ad hoc arbitrators than standing members of a permanent body. So let us pause now, where, where are we uh, if we're looking at these three pressure points? Uh, there are some issues about selection, appointment of dispute uh, resolvers, and there's some issues about disciplinary <coughs> uh, powers. At the same time, it doesn't seem that these issues are so troublesome that they would require the radical changes that we see now from an ad hoc arbitral uh, framework to a standing court. So I have thought there must be something else, right? And we need to pursue the inquiry to see uh, what else could it be. And I have done this by continuing to compare uh, with uh, courts, international and national courts. So if we go to, we look at uh, international courts. They, are, they have five characteristics. They're permanent body established by law, they apply international law they, and pre-existing procedures, and they give binding decisions. Investment arbitration meets all these characteristics, but, but the permanence. And the permanence, uh, of course, implies uh, institutionalization well beyond the in, uh, in arbitral institutions that simply facilitate the administration of the case. 
we all know of the drawbacks of institutionalization, but uh, we must also admit that permanent institutions do convey an impression of solidity, of presence, that is very different from the fragile, precarious nature of ad hoc arbitration tribunals. And I've tried to capture uh, this uh, contrast with pictures. On the one hand, you have a brick and mortar courthouse, and you all recognize, of course, the Peace Palace and the Hague. And on the other hand, you have a pedestrian tribunal uh, walking on a sidewalk. It's in front of the uh, building that houses Ixid. But still, they're just, they have no building. They're just loosely there. So um, there's another, in, in, in addition to uh, the uh, difference in terms of permanence or institutionalization of international courts. There's another difference that is striking to me when I compare uh, courts and arbitral tribunals, and that is the number of decision makers. Uh, in investment arbitration, you have three, uh, rarely one, but never more than three. Uh, if you look at international courts, you have numbers that are much higher. You have ICJ 15, or if you have adult judges 17, a European Court of Human Rights, seven or 17, depending on the type of cases, it laws, uh, European Court, uh, the W appellate body has, I concede, three people deciding on a case, but at the same time, uh, they do confer with their four other colleagues that are uh, the members of the uh, of the appellate body. If you look at the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, which could be a model for uh, a reform uh, that has three or nine, and nine each time that you have an important issue or you want to overrule a prior case. I have then uh, continued my comparison and looked at highest courts uh, in national, uh, uh, in different states, and taken those that are more familiar to me. Uh, nine on the US Supreme Court, I don't need to tell you that. Uh, five in the German Bundesgerichtshof, five French Cour de Cassation, five Swiss Supreme Court. Um, <coughs> of course, you can tell me, I mean, what, what, are, what uh, investment arbitrators decide is not of the level uh, uh, of the impact, a similar impact <coughs> like these courts. Well, it all depends on the case, right? I mean, if you look at the reactions at some recent awards or the public debate about investor state arbitration, uh, some, some decisions at least uh, could easily be compared to many decisions of these highest courts. So uh, what struck me when I looked at this is the number of five. And then I went into, uh, I looked at some uh, psychology studies about uh, group dynamics. And although not uncontroversial to be uh, open, uh, they seem to indicate that five is an is a optimal number for efficient decision making. If you're below five, uh, the was three or, or fewer, uh, individuals seem more exposed and therefore less prone to make, making decisions. If you're bel above five, uh, the, the, the process becomes too cumbersome and, 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 less, uh, and less efficient, and, and, and people less engaged. So what do I draw from all this? Essentially, that the current system gives individual arbitrators, and they're, remember, they're unelected individuals, huge leverage. And is, although this is never articulated in these terms, I think this uh, huge leverage uh, e explains the essence of the accountability or legitimacy concerns that trigger the changes that, we, uh, that are being discussed. And there are several concerns that uh, do reinforce uh, this uh, this, uh, there's several factors that reinforce 
uh, this concern. The pool of arbitrators is very, very small. I mean, insiders think this is great because it's a merits-based pool. But what insiders think is, is, is irrelevant. You have to look at what outsiders perceive, and they rather perceive this like a small club where all kinds of dubious arrangements and compromises are, are, are made. There's another, there's another factor that uh, increases the concern about the leverage of individuals is uh, the return of the state after, after uh, the economic financial crisis. Uh, and decades of disempowerment of the state, we see a new area, era, era where states are very strong in asserting uh, their, their sovereign uh, rights. There is also the progress of democracy. Uh, democracy has uh, made a lot of progress in the last decades. In 72, we would count uh, 40 democracies, democratic states in the world. In 2014, 122. Now you can you you can quarrel about one one about the classification of one or the other regime, but that is not my point. My point is that the trend is is overwhelming, and is no surprise. Uh, that uh, the criticism of, of investment arbitration comes up in this context. Uh, why does democracy uh, matter here? Well, it matters because democratic culture favors institution and fundamentally distrusts the powers of individuals, non-elected individuals. Think of the hostility uh, again, of a civil society vis-a-vis -vis CEOs of uh, multinational uh, groups. It's the same type of distrust of powerful uh, individuals. So where do we go from here? And, th uh, and that leads me to my third part. I'm looking at my watch because I should, should we move on. So if you accept my analysis that uh, the current system uh, gives non-elected individuals uh, powers that are difficult to reconcile with uh, democratic values, then that has, must have an impact on the reforms to come. And there is, of course, a risk, uh, having identified this fragility of the current regime, to shift to the other extreme, and the other extreme would be, uh, would be shifting for the paradigm that we have now that is more commercial arbitration and go to state-to-state, -state, interstate dispute settlement. And that would be, I submit, a mistake because it would uh, not take into account the hybrid nature of investment arbitration. Investment arbitration is investor-state arbitration. It's not state-state. So that needs to be uh, taken into account. And it will also sacrifice the gains of the current system. It's not because I have now focused on the deficiencies of the cur uh, current system that the current system does not have gains as well. And the gains, I would, I would, if you, I take a, a big uh, a look at the big pictures, I would say there are three important uh, gains. One is neutrality. That is, or distance, if you want, distance from politics of the dispute resolver, distance from business of the dispute resolver. That's the depoliticization of investment arbitration that was praised when it, uh, it, when it, when it was introduced, and, and rightly so. Then there is the finality of the uh, award uh, the, that uh, is certainly an asset of the current system, and that is why one should be very careful about introducing appeals. Appeals make the process longer, more expensive, when everybody complains that it is already too long and too expensive. And then the third, the third again, I would say, is the manageability of the process. It's, it's a light administration, because it's the ad hoc nature makes it uh, lighter than he uh, heavier uh, permanent bodies. Think of the WTO um, dispute settlement uh, system. That is quite a heavy system, has a huge secretariat, 
uh, that is indispensable to, uh, for the dispute settlement to perform. So what is the, what is the objective? taking all of this into account. The objective would be uh, to be able to introduce a dispute settlement mechanism that would fix the democratic accountability deficiency. And that needs to be uh, thought of how this could be done. We can discuss it in a moment. Uh, takes account of the asymmetric nature of the investment arbitration and to the extent possible preserves the gain of the current system. Now how to do this, uh, of course uh, that, is a, that is a very uh, long discussion how to do this. I have uh, calls or the report of, of the Center for International Dispute Settlement or SIDS for UNCITRAL reviewing, giving a roadmap of how this could be done and we're now in another project a research project trying to look at what can be learned from international courts and tribunals as they exist, what should be copied and what should not be copied. Uh, so uh, that is a, long, uh, is, a, is a long discussion. Let me just mention a few avenues and then I, we can open up for, for, for discussion. Uh, we, I would say we should absolutely explore uh, the idea of increasing the number of decision makers. It's also linked with nationality issues, but the number of decision makers is something that at least for certain types of cases uh, could be increased. Uh, we need to work on the selection uh, mode. Uh, that is quite a dif difficult uh, topic, raises many issues. Um, one possibility would, have, would be to have a roster of adjudicators that are established with the input of all the stakeholders uh, and from which then the uh, disputing parties could choose. So it would mean uh, it would uh, provide a standing body, but at the same time it would take account of the asymmetric nature of the uh, of the dispute settlement uh, mechanism, we should also possibly introduce a coordination or consultation mechanism between the decision makers, and that is uh, in part to uh, respond to another criticism, which is the inconsistency of decision making in uh, investment arbitration. But it would also avoid an appeal, incorporating an appeal into a new uh, settlement body because that would do away with the lightness and it would do away with the finality. The, the coordination consultation mechanism is, is, is something that is well known. Uh, you have this in national courts when U.S. courts sit en banc, I don't know how you pronounce this, en banc, I think, uh, full court. Uh, and uh, you have uh, the same thing as you have seen before for the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. You have something similar for the WTO appellate body, so that is certainly something that was some innovative thinking can be, uh, can be and could be uh, designed. And that is what I had to say. And I'll stop here because there will be much more to say. I'm sure you have questions. And if we have, can resolve all this issue, we have a new dawn over investment dispute settlement and we will dispel the clouds. So if you have a question, can you put your hand up? We'll try to see how we do with time. Any questions? Abby, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I, uh, you mentioned that there is a price to make to go to arbitrate with many of the questions, and I just wonder how you see that expanding um, and especially for the women on the circuit. <laughs> <laughs> It is absolutely important that uh, investment arbitration uh, 
and the arbitrator proof becomes more diverse and more expanded and there are efforts being made in that respect but it will not resolve the fundamental accountability issue right uh, these were still even women or individuals <laughs> Wait. There, there are some people you could tell the, the studies they like. Sure. Go here and then come here. Okay. Yes. Professor, I was wondering, <coughs> where do you see <coughs> between the three conflicting points, um, the conflict of interest, uh, the, the pressure points, the conflict of interest? Uh, would you see it more in the accountability part? Conflict of interest? Yeah, I didn't go into this, uh, of course. Uh, by the fact that you have ad hoc arbitrators, the opportunities for conflicts do arise much more. Uh, and then you have the added issue of uh, the, the, the double hat, uh, where you have is uh, issue conflicts, that is one arbitrator rules on one issue and the next day the same arbitrator as counsel pleads uh, before another tribunal, maybe the contrary, or maybe the same thing. Uh, my, uh, my view of this uh, is that uh, in investment arbitration, actually like in sports arbitration, one should not do both. Either you're an arbitrator or you're counsel. But that is my personal, that's my personal <laughs> rule. Of course, uh, it, no institution has said so, but maybe if institutions would, are courageous enough, they may set this rule. The Court of Arbitration for Sports in a completely different domain has done so. Uh, Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really thought through this yet because that's my current project and I'm waiting to have more input on this. What cannot be done is what the EU uh, TTIP proposal or the CETA uh, provides, which what they have is one national of each, I mean, of investor country and uh, state respondent. Now, already I don't really know how that, this would be one for EU, 27 or, I mean, for the time being 28 states, so, and, and one for US if you're in TTIP. So that already creates some kind of imbalance if you want to have a, a, an equality in terms of nationality. But then, and, and then you have one chair that is for, from a neutral country. With the results that uh, the, if, if both co-arbitrators uh, espouse the case of their uh, national or state, which I don't know, that would have to be seen how this works out, then the whole, the whole burden of the decision depends only on the chair. And then you, go, you have an appeal and that has exactly the same composition. So in the end, the result of the outcome of the case will depend on the chair of the appellate panel. That is one person. And when, of course, that person would be part of a permanent institution. And that may somehow alleviate the concern about uh, leverage. But I don't think uh, that is a good result uh, of, of a reform. Okay. Yeah, more questions? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> 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 thanks, thanks for a very interesting talk. I, I just wonder, to, to what extent do you think reputational concerns play a role um, in ensuring accountability? Be because, uh, say, for the more typical Cosmo judge on a final court review, read the previous law to complain. It, it appears to be a very strong concern that judges want to prove themselves, if, if, if not mean, command authority by way of being credit. I'm not sure if it's... It, it, it relates to your proposal of expanding the school of arbitration system to a more standard one that has less chance of killing their reputation. Yeah. 
But, but, but that's what happens now, right? You, uh, the same ones get appointed and reappointed because they have a track record and uh, parties want trust the track record and that is, a, uh, is an impediment to the expansion. The reputation is, is, is all an ad hoc arbitrator has to make a living, right? And so the reputation is, 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 is really very important. I don't want my awards to be annulled. I don't want to get disqualified. All of these issues that you may have. Does that answer your point or not really? I mean, in a standing institution, this changes, of course, and the reputational factor is largely diminished. So, so you don't think under your proposal there would be any uh, deterioration if you get the right word? Deterioration of... of the reputation of the no, no, I, I, it, I, I would not be surprised that the quality of the output of a standing body is less good than what we see now. But that's not the question, right? We're not here to judge quality. We're here to judge acceptability of a dispute settlement system. It, it may be sobering, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably take one last question. I think, Lisa, your hand went up first, so I'll let you take it. I am, I am uh, uh, very skeptical of, of the nationality issue, but I have not yet got to really uh, a conclusion in my mind what the right answer is to this, because the idea that you need a national who will defend your position on, on the court does not make sense if you want an impartial court. I mean, it's, it's directly contradictory, right? So how do you achieve this? I don't know. Probably states will want to have nationals of theirs on the court. But like FIFA wants to have uh, FIFA people on the <coughs> court of arbitration for sport. And so, so that seems a natural drive. But uh, how exactly to make sure that it does not impact the impartiality, uh, that's that is more difficult to me. Right now, you don't have this problem. So you think that the reputation of the arbitrator is essential also to the rest of the arbitrators, even if you are Yeah, but if you're, uh, if you're a member of a five-member tribunal, the reputation, uh, w it will not be seen what you have done unless you, 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 you draft a dissenting opinion. The reputation in the end is more that the one of the person who chairs and drafts and and tries to make sure that everybody on the court agrees with the drafting. Great. Thank you very much, Professor. Can I invite everybody to give <laughs> any <laughs> alumni, so we thought it's appropriate to give her a baker a gift. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's true, I was a big Mackenzie partner many years ago. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very honored to be coming and accepting our offer. We've tried this in the third year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God damn, you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> this was the lucky batch. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>